At NVIDIA, we've been working with Remedy on their upcoming supernatural action adventure game Control to implement ray tracing effects. Both opaque and transparent reflections, dynamic, diffuse, indirect global illumination, and ray trace contact hardening soft shadows. Now we're going to dive into each of those four ray trace effects. So here we have a simplified diagram that will help us explain the opaque reflections. We have an eye, or a camera, and we're going to trace a primary ray to a surface. In this case, it's an opaque surface. When that ray intersects the surface, we're going to evaluate for its material properties, things like roughness and specularity. That, in turn, will help us determine both the length and the direction of our reflection vector. If that reflection vector intersects another surface, we will use that for reflection. If it terminates or doesn't intersect another surface, we'll use the pre-computed global illumination. The end result of that ray tracing will, of course, be denoised with a traditional spatial and temporal denoiser. In the first case, the screen space reflections is showing our character standing in front of a reflective surface, but she's not actually properly reflected because the front of the character, in fact, isn't on screen, so can't be computed. In the second example, we're showing our ray-traced opaque reflections, and it's shown properly because we're actually ray-tracing the reflection to the character, properly displaying the result. We also support transparent reflections. So to compute that, we again go to our diagram, we shoot a primary ray to find the transparent surface. We compute the normal from that transparent surface as we're doing simple mirror reflections. The result is that you can see both through it, transparency, as well as see the reflection from it from the reflected ray. The first example, we don't enable transparent reflections. And what we're looking at here is a piece of glass and we're showing the translucent component where you can see through the glass into an office environment beyond it. Now with ray trace transparent reflections on, you can see it's an entirely new view. The reflections are showing the environment behind the character, which is entirely off screen. And in this case, we're seeing some indoor trees and office vegetation reflected in the glass. Next, we're gonna look at indirect diffuse, which is a form of global illumination. Looking at our simplified diagram, we're gonna trace a ray to an object. We're gonna evaluate the surface properties of that object to determine the direction and length of our indirect rays. If those indirect rays terminate before they hit another object, we're gonna use pre-computed global illumination values. However, if those indirect rays intersect with another object or another surface, we're gonna use that to compute our diffuse indirect term. Here we have a scene with ray trace diffuse illumination turned off and it looks a little traditionally computer generated. This is a fairly common appearance in real-time rendering today. With ray trace diffuse illumination, you can see that scene has a much more natural lit look. The lighting is much more realistic with ambient inclusion, and it has that color bleeding approach that's so common in global illumination style effects. Lastly, we're gonna look at ray trace contact hardening shadows. We're gonna trace rays towards light sources, and we're gonna pick those lights based on their size and intensity. If these rays as they're tracing towards lights are blocked or occluded, that will tell us that they're in shadow. We use the ray trace shadows to fill in where shadow map resolution is insufficient. In the real world, shadow properties are such that the shadow tends to be harder or sharper the closer it gets to the object that's casting it. As you can see here, without ray trace shadows, the shadow itself is soft, and in fact, you can't even see the contact point between the table leg and the floor. With it on, you can see the shadow has the proper behavior, harder, closer to the object casting it, and it gets softer in the distance. Now we're seeing a variety of in-game footage. As you can see, it has a much more realistic, immersive feel to those environments, helping to really draw the player in. One of the great things about Control is they've implemented a huge range of ray tracing effects. It's incredibly important because Control features a bunch of dynamic destruction, meaning the world is being changed in real time. So being able to compute all of these things dynamically is incredibly critical to the immersiveness of the game. Let's dive into a single frame of analysis and start with the GeForce RTX 2080. You can see in this case, we've disabled the RT cores, which means we're running the ray tracing workload on the shaders. But the Turing architecture features parallel floating point and integer execution, which provides a speed up over that of Pascal. In the bottom, we've turned RT cores on, which allows us to run the ray tracing workload on the RT cores themselves. That gives us a huge speed up, in this case, about a factor of two compared to RT cores off. Breaking down a single frame on an RTX GPU, we can see all the various workloads involved in producing a frame. One of the nice things about this graph is it shows all the various execution engines operating in parallel, which is one of the great features of the Turing architecture. So starting with the opaque reflections on the left, you can see that big chunk of green work. That's reflection work being executed in the RT cores. Right after that is shading. The reflections themselves incur shading because you need to shade what's reflected. And then we do denoising, and so on and so forth through the frame. Control is going to be a fantastic game. We can't wait for gamers to get their hands on it. We hope you enjoy playing it as much as we enjoy building it. Thanks for watching.